Hello and welcome to the Car Kirana channel live stream. How are you guys doing? Hope everybody's doing well today. Well, before we get started, I want to say a few things. Of course, why wouldn't I want to say a few things? So um, a lot of a lot of you guys have asked me, where do I get a repair manual? Where do I get my parts? What's the deal here? I'm going to put two websites. And by the way, this is not a promotion or anything. Of course, the stuff belongs to Toyota. I work for them. Not directly. I work at a dealership, but this is not affiliated or a promotion or whatever. I just want you guys, if you need the information, you can get it. I'm going to put the first website. This is a, I put it in the chat, and I'll later put it as a comment in the video if you're watching this later. So this is where you get your access to your repair manual, the official repair manual. Super expensive, just heads up. But uh, if you really want, you can actually get text stream access too. That's one thing I recently found out that that was actually allowed in that. The other one is parts.toyota.com. I get a lot of questions about parts and how to find them. That's the official website. Folks, always shop around. Be careful of counterfeits on some online retailers. But uh, that's the website you want to go to. Put your VIN number and find any parts you need. Check the price there and then Google the same part number. And then you'll find parts, original parts for cheaper. Just make sure you verify that the source is a... Toyota dealership, not some random whatever seller that could sell you counterfeits. Having said that, let's start the live stream. Let's start with the questions. So Oblivion Bubble, and I read this question before we started. That was a very interesting question. I, drove, I drive a lot on the German Autobahn. The other day you said it is not good for hybrids to drive at high speed. I often drive close to top speed of my car. Should I... Buy something else than Lexus Hybrid. Honestly, um, the Autobahn, of course, you're going to want to go full speed. I wish we lived there. That would be nice for my heavy foot. But uh, hybrids, probably not the most efficient thing to do. They're going to take it. They're going to be fine at top speed. But the efficiency goes out of the window. And now they become um, just as any other gas guzzler. And some actually cars with bigger engines that will be comfortable at top speed might even get better gas mileage believe it or not but that's that's a unique situation only germany has the awesome autobahn that has no speed limit uh, everybody else in the world all of us uh, we don't have that so that's nice but also it, the hybrid might not be the best option for that but how often are you driving on the autobahn is it a daily commute to work i don't know how things work over there if it is then might not be but if it's every once in a while it's not a problem in that at that case so mike h says what do you think is more reliable the four cylinder or v6 camry so they're both good the v6 costs more potentially when there is ever issues because it's a little bigger it's jammed in the car and it's really hard to work around some of the labor operations you got to drop the whole subframe in the engine but reliability wise they seem to, to hold really well. The four cylinders are great, but the some of the four cylinders are known for oil consumption. And I know this is, we're not talking about the 2.4 liter in the old 0709 Camry. We're talking about the 2AR, which started in 2010 all the way to 17. And of course, now we have the new 2.5 liter, the A25A. I don't take care of them with maintenance and they're going to burn oil. As simple as that. And I know some people jump up and say, I have two, 300,000 miles and I don't burn a drop. Well, you take care of your car. People that don't, you're going to have oil consumption. And that's just the way it is with these four cylinders. The V6 holds much better, but maintenance costs, not maintenance, more repairs, water pump, leaks, whatever the case may be down the road when the thing is older, they're going to cost more than your four cylinder. So Michael Sanders says, any special considerations when actually, this is a very good question, Michael, any special considerations when washing a Toyota hybrid with a power washer car wash? So you asked to, there is, I'm going to add to that question a little bit because I get asked this question a lot. If you have a hybrid, you have, you should have first no problem washing the car outside, having jet spray underneath folks, the high voltage wires that run underneath the car. They're heavily insulated for weather. I mean, you're driving, water is splashing. If you live in Chicago like me or some other areas, salt is splashing in the winter. That's They're protected for that. That's not an issue. Another thing is if you're washing under the hood, a lot of people have asked about that. There should be no problem washing it. Just 
if you're using a pressure washer, do not direct the pressure washer at the inverter, which is where the big orange wires connect to, and try to avoid, even this is not just hybrids, any car, try to avoid direct water pressure at electrical connectors. They're weatherproof, but they're not weather sealed where 100, no matter what you do to them. If you direct pressurized water directly at them, you're going to penetrate the seal, and now you have a problem because you have water sitting inside. And as a bonus, and, and just to really take things to the next level, take, take some compressed air and dry up the connectors just to push the water away from them, and you should have zero issues after that. Another thing is undercoating, and I'm going to just touch briefly on this. You should have, I don't know why some dealers are afraid to undercoat hybrids. There should be no issues undercoating hybrids. If you live in the rust belt or the salt belt, as one viewer would correct me on that, you have to, you, I want you to undercoat your car. Use a good undercoating. Don't be afraid of the hybrids. They're the same as any other car undercoating wise. So Beth, Beth Wakefield says, I have a coolant antifreeze leak from under the front hood passenger side on my 2010 Venza. So Beth, I'm reading the rest of your question. I occasionally fill the coolant plastic reservoir to the fill line about every two weeks when it slowly starts leaking onto the ground near the reservoir tank. So two things. First, do you have a leak or are you overfilling it? So the thing with this bottle is if you fill it to full when you're cold, when the car engine is cold, you overfilled it because you're supposed to be somewhere halfway, halfway to a little bit less. When the engine is fully warmed up, that's when it should be at full. But if you're leaking on the passenger side, that might be a water pump. If it's not from the reservoir itself, that might be a water pump, something you want to get taken care of pretty soon. Other thing is a radiator, more likely a water pump. That's the only thing that's common to leak on the passenger side of the engine. You want to get that taken care of if you're starting to see drips on the floor, especially. So Dave, thank you for your super chat, sir. Found a 2002 Corolla CE manual transmission for my kids to from school. The only issue I see is a small oil leak from above the oil pan for 1500 bucks and 150,000 miles. Is this a fair deal? So Dave and everybody else, I personally think the 1999, actually 98 to 2002 Corolla is not the, didn't age very well. Let's put it this way. Somebody will jump in the chat and say, no, it's the greatest car. And, at one point it was, but it's not the greatest old used cheap old car to buy. They make sure this thing is not rusty. If it's rusty, it's not worth the 1500. They rust really bad, brake lines, fuel lines, body, everything else just starts falling apart at some point. If it's not rusty, then that's good. The next thing you want to check is, does this engine burn oil? No real, if the, if the previous owner lies to you, then tell you. Unfortunately, there's no way to know, but they were notorious for that. So that's kind of a problem. And if you buy one, I understand it's a 1500 buck car. You're giving it to your kid. They're not going to go far away. They're not depending on this car for long trips and whatever. But you maybe it's a good car to start the habit of checking your engine oil, checking the fluids, and kind of enter them into the world of actual owning a car where you got to take care of it, not just start the key and go and daddy will deal with the rest. That's not a good thing to teach our kids. Um, start with the oil checking because they do burn oil a lot otherwise if the thing doesn't have rust and doesn't burn oil it's an okay car not very comfortable but it's otherwise i can say reliable as far as the leak that's probably a front timing cover notorious on these not something I'm, i would consider fixing try to clean it up so it doesn't make smoke and that's when it really becomes a problem otherwise you should be good so a lot Electrohead says, do you think I will be able to upgrade my 2021 Camry hybrid to the new solid state battery in the, in the future? Probably not, honestly, because you have to really change everything and it's not exactly plug and play. That's the same with nickel metal hydride to lithium ion. It's not just a plug and play deal where you just do it and life is good. You'd have to go through a lot of hoops to do that. It's not a simple plug and play. Marcos Castellanos, I'm trying to read the names here. I'm getting better at names now. Sorry if I misread it. Love your videos. My 2003 Lexus GX is running great, but there is a loud hum coming from the dashboard when I start it up for about five seconds. Any ideas? Honestly, Marcos, I would need to hear it. 
the hum, it's it's really hard for me to just right off the bat tell you something. I don't know if anything common could be. The only thing I can think of, and I'm not sure if you would call this common, it might be because of age, is one of the servo motors, the motors that control all the doors for the AC. When you start the car, they do like a little self self calibration, self test. If they have a problem, some of them will go to their max range and they'll start making noise and then come back. That's the only thing that might be the case. Otherwise, I'd need to hear it. The way to know that is you can start hearing underneath the dash, find the location of them, put your hand on it when you start the car, and you'll see which one is making noise. Unplug it, see if the noise goes away. And if that's, then just replace the servo motor and life is good. All righty. So Jose Burgo says, my 2000, no, he didn't say that. I said that. <laughs> My RAV4 V6 Limited with the dual climate control has an issue where only the AC works and not hot air blows out scan, got a code, air mix, damper control, servo motor, driver's side. So you have a dual climate. If one of them is affected or two, that's, that's a question you're going to want to, that's an answer I'm going to need for this, but I'll give you a general thing. You're going to find this servo, you're going to, Kind of tell, you need to distinguish, is it a servo problem or is it a mechanical door problem? The the air mix door, all it does is it mixes hot and cold. You're going to want to pull that uh, servo out. Servo is just a little motor that turns the door. You're going to pull it out, move the door manually, it, run the car, move it to hot, move in one direction. You should get hot air, move it to the other direction. You should get cold air. If that's working... Good news. You only need a servo. Life's good. But if it doesn't do that or the door is just jammed and it doesn't want to move, we have a problem. Dash has to come out. Box has to be inspected, most likely replaced. These, there's not really service parts for it. But that's the direction I would head. Uh, Dana Broder. Sorry if I misread your name. 2015 Avalon has 53,000 miles with no transmission change. I'm going to do a drain and fill. Should I do it again the next couple oil changes? Honestly, no. Most people want to get that bright red fluid and life is good. Eh, I, I'm not into that. I'm into you're going to replace a portion enough of the fluid where you're going to refresh everything and life is good. You don't want to overdo it either because that's also not good. Do it once. Call it a day. Another six years. You're right around the six-year range here, less than 60,000 miles, which you are perfectly in time, in my opinion. Um, after six years or 60,000 miles, whoever comes first, do it again. Life is good. That's I wouldn't I wouldn't overdo it. A lot of people do, and really you're not benefiting much. And at some point, if you really overdo it, it becomes not good for the transmission. Bob Lovelet, thank you so much for your super chat, sir. Let's continue. So anything fixed. I'm looking for a cheap car. Is the Toyota Yaris 2008 a good choice? Is there any year model I should avoid? What should I look for when inspecting it? Is there any common issues? So the, I don't know if you are based in the U.S., but I'll talk about the U.S. Yaris 2007 to 2000, oh my God, when did they stop making the Yaris? 13, 14, something like that when they changed it to the new one. I think 15 was the, was the updated one when we went to hatchback only and then the Mazda came. But that year range that you're looking at, let's say 07, 08, 09, they're all really the same. They're really good cars. They do have a few issues. One of them is rust. Of course, they're older, and they were not on the high-end side with material, especially on the inside, a lot of plastic. But uh, overall, it's a good car. Check it for oil leak. Check the head gasket. Not for mixing oil and coolant. Don't get me wrong. Not for leaking coolant or having any issues. No, they leak oil externally. So you lift the car up, look behind the engine like... You're look, you're standing underneath the car. You're not going to want to lift it up or at least lean underneath it. Picture this. The car is up. You're standing facing the front of the car. You're going to look up right behind the engine. If it's covered in oil top to bottom, that's a problem because you're going to need to replace the head gasket. They're notorious for that. Other thing is wheel bearings. Drive it. Make sure it's quiet. They're notorious to eat up wheel bearings. Water pump. Super easy to replace. Not really a deal breaker, but check it. You'll see that stripe of coolant on the hood. That's how you usually tell they're leaking. Otherwise, overall, they're good cars. If they've been maintained, of course, don't buy one that's neglected. <clears throat> you can find them very cheap. They're very basic cars. I mean, very basic. And the sedan and the hatchback, they're both the same thing. 
they, they did have a few recalls that you're going to want to take care of if they are still open. So Stephen White, my 2009 Corolla at start up, it hesitates as if it's about to shut down. But after three seconds, it runs fine. What could it be causing it to hesitate? So a few things come to mind. First, if it rattles when you started it up, that's a variable valve timing gear running, like draining the oil overnight. That could cause a hesitation. You don't have the, if you have the rattle, you need to replace that BBTI gear. If you do not have the rattle, clean the throttle body. That's, that's the first thing I usually tell you. Clean the throttle body. And another thing that's somewhat common on these, um, Somewhat common on these Corollas is a ground that goes from the battery to the, the ground, like corrodes, and now you have bad contact. When you put high load, it kind of cranks the engine and drops the overall voltage, and the whole car shakes and barely starts, and then it starts fine. Check that. One good way to check it is you're stopped, car is running, you're in drive but not moving. Turn on the lights or on the fan full blast, radio on, pop, basically put a lot of load on the car. And then grab the steering wheel and turn very fast. If you feel the steering wheel starts binding, you might have that ground issue. And this is commonly misdiagnosed as a bad battery, bad alternator. It's just the ground that's corroding in the body, and now you have bad contact. The, the reason the steering wheel starts binding is because it's electric steering. It'll, you'll, you're putting too much load where that motor has no, not enough power to turn smoothly. So that's how you'll usually diagnose those. But... These are the first three things I would look at. So Andrew Will, hi, and thank you for your car talk. I have a 2011 regular cab Tacoma 2.7 liter automatic 71K. Is it too late to change the transmission fluid? So you have two questions, Andrew. I'll get to the first one, then we'll go to the second one, which is interesting. Um, so you're at 71,000 miles. You're right around... 10 years, you're a little bit over with time, but a little bit over with mileage, but I, you're still within the time where I would just do a simple drain and fill and call it a day. I wouldn't do any flush or anything like that. Do a single drain and fill and your life is good. Another question is, my wife is a, is a stickler for Nissans. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I am a Toyota fan. If I could convince her, what are the pluses and minuses comparison between a Forerunner and a Highlander? So, Here's the best way I'll put it. The Forerunner is a truck. It is a body and frame, kind of like your Tacoma. And it's more for off-roading, not really... It does have... It has a pretty smooth ride, actually. It has some creature comforts, but it's not really geared towards the family car with all the little options and smooth ride. And the, It's more for off-roading. It's a serious off-roader, and it's a very reliable truck. Like, it's the thing is ancient, and it's they really shock you with the reliability. Not with techie features and like fuel economy and family-oriented trucks. No, the thing is an honest-to-God off-roader and it does so well with that. The Highlander is more of a, okay, you don't do any off-roading. The Forerunner might be overkill. The Highlander is more of the, it's still all-wheel drive, so it does great in snow, rain, all these situations, but it's more smoother, quieter, more of a family car. It's a nicer car, but it's not as capable as the Forerunner. So it really depends on your use. And uh, Nissan, at some point, believe it or not, my first car was a Nissan. I'm sorry, Datsun, not a Nissan. So I know a lot about Nissan. Over the years, they kind of did one of those things. Unfortunately, they used to make really interesting cars, and they still do have a few interesting cars here and there, but their quality overall kind of went downhill. I hope one day that changes. Maybe if they uh, shake hands and walk away from Renault, that, that will change because Renaults are horrible cars, at least from I remember back home. Cherep777, thank you for your super chat, sir. Is it better to charge the RAV4 Prime on 8 amp compared to 16 to 32 amp? Is there a fix for the car not opening, not recognizing fob? Have to open with a key. So a few things. On the RAV4 Prime, and you will see this in the upcoming video, and actually next week's video on Wednesday. You can only charge, there's only two possibility of charging. You can charge it at 120 or uh, 240. I think 16 amp is the max that it will take. So if you have the 6.6 .6 charger, I'm, I'm coding here, I don't remember the exact details, but you can even charge it 110 or 240. 
that's about it. And you're limited by the onboard charging. If you have an SE, it's actually a lesser charge, smaller charge of 3.3, similar to the RAV4, uh, to the Prius Prime. If you have an XSE, it's a 6.6. It's a bit bigger charger, so it can charge faster. But other than that, I wouldn't go too much on picking chargers. And I would just use the wall, honestly. That's what I would do, but everybody has different needs. And then is there a fix for the door not opening, not recognizing the fob, have to open with the key? The first thing is, is it a car problem or a location problem? Because they really don't have issues with the smart key recognizing the key. Not It's possible, but not very common. First thing I would do is change the battery and the key. Second thing is, Look around you. Do you have interference? Do you have high voltage lines? Do you have a radio station across the street? Folks, these, these keys really get thrown off by the interference. And we've seen this. And, and, and also, and here's another question for you. Does it happen only in one spot, like at home or at work or at this supermarket or somewhere specific or is random everywhere? That's how you're going to establish that pattern. But definitely the first thing is change the battery. And then you have two keys with this car. Use the other key for a while. See if it does it. Try to establish a pattern at this point, unless you have 60, 000, uh, 36,000 miles on this car. It's likely under warranty. Take it in. But I I'll just tell you, they're going to test it. Yep, it's working. Sorry, no problem. Found. Find a pattern before you go and waste your time. That's what I would do. That's what I encourage you to do so you wouldn't waste your time. I don't want you to go to the dealership and have this aggravation. Oh, you're crazy. There's no problem. Found. I really dislike saying that to people when they come in the dealership because it makes them feel like I'm calling them crazy. I usually take people. I'm like, okay, your car is making noise. I drove it. I can't hear it. But is it my driving style? Let's go for a ride. Let me talk to you. And we get in. They draw it. And we're like, yep, it's not making the noise now, of course, because we're here. I'm like, don't feel bad. I usually look at, at the warranty and how much time they have left. I'm like, don't worry. You have a lot of time left. I checked the car. Everything's fine. So I'm not worried about your safety. But we're going to get to the bottom of this. But just be patient because it's going to take some multiple tries and we'll get to it. So find the patterns or you wouldn't waste your time going back and forth to the dealership. AB, thank you so much for your, for your super chat. <clears throat> Would transmission fluid overfill of, let's say, half a quart cause issues? Is it a problem of additional oil increasing pressure within the transmission? So the thing with, with overfilling the transmission is half a quart is right around the range where it's okay. It's not something that I'm extremely concerned about. I'd rather it half a quart overfill than half a quart underfill. Then we have problems. But the, the thing what happens with the transmissions is when you overfill them, it gets to a point where you have too much fluid. Now it's rising inside the case, and it could be picked up and be thrown around too much, where it's, now it starts creating a drag. We, I've noticed the six-speed transmission, for some reason, starts howling when you overfill it with transmission. I don't know about too much pressure because it's a pump, and you know it picks up from the sump, but it shouldn't matter. But it starts over-splashing, and now you start having noises, possible leaks. The only other area where it would be a problem, not on. if you are the same AV I am thinking about, who is a Patreon of mine, you have a Tundra. The Tundra wouldn't be so much with this issue, but... Say you have a front-wheel drive car or all-wheel drive car where it's a transverse setup. You could have too much oil where it kind of overflows in the axle and start leaking. But half a quart, probably not going to do it. But if the best way to do this is if you're half a quart overfilled, correct it. Life is good. So there's no question to the doubt and everything is good. All right. So Andrew, sorry, Andrew Will, another question I didn't see it earlier. Living in the Rust Belt, I want my Tacoma to last forever. Do you have any suggestions for undercoating? Honestly, this will depend where you live. I hear a lot of folks from Canada talk about Crown being a really good one. I haven't looked into them. They are actually really good. Uh, it, it matters more what the, not really what brand you choose. It's more how often are you going to reapply it. So every year and then you know after we are done with the winter look underneath the truck you see spots that are scraped by small stuff small spots across touch them up life's good fluid film is another good one that we use a lot here in my area but crown i've heard a lot of good things about from um folks in canada okay Oop. what happened to the super jet what happened to the chat here here we go so Dana, 15 Avalon. Oh, sorry, we already answered this one. Let's see. Huh. 
Luxus man, how you doing, man? Hasn't even started it and already a thumbs down with. Well, it happens. What are you gonna do? That's everybody has their own uh, their own thing. So, R, I have a 2021 Toyota 4Runner. What kind of undercoating do you recommend? So, I talked about the Crown. Fluid film is really good. It really depends on where you live and the up applicators in your area. Unless you're doing, if you're doing it yourself, fluid film is really good. And it's easy to apply. Stinky, but it's easy to apply and it works really good. William Castillo, good evening. On a 2007 Sienna with 98,000 miles, transmission fluid never been changed. Can the transmission fluid be flushed or just change the fluid? Just change the fluid. Drain and fill. You're right in the edge where I start feeling a little uncomfortable about changing the fluid. But just the drain and fill, you're safe there and call it a day. Don't do it multiple times. Just do it once. Call it a day and you should be good. So Golfman Cardina says, what are your thoughts on the new Tundra? I am shortly going to be in the market for a new vehicle. Yes, the Tundra Talk. Are we going to have a Tundra Talk like last last live stream? Let's do it real quick. Folks, the Tundra is coming. Other than the pictures you see online, I don't know anything about it because Toyota is extremely secretive. I am in the service and kind of the operations land, not really in the design or marketing or all the other stuff. We don't talk. I have a lot of people that I know that work for Toyota. Mum's the word. That's how they are. They just don't share. We, I respect Toyota. And believe it or not, and I will say this briefly, the picture that you saw today, I have seen a while back. You know, the dealers will have meetings and they do take pictures. They try not to share it because it kind of ruins the surprise of the car. I have seen the Tundra for a while, but I did not share the picture. I did not because that is common courtesy and respect. It's it's coming out. It's not a state secret. The thing is coming out. You got to give the manufacturer the time to come up with the details. But some folks are more interested in the buzz that it creates when you come out with something first time. I'm not really interested in that. I'm more interested in Toyota taking their time and doing what they need to do to make the new product. But one thing I will say about the picture they released, the one that says I, I, uh, Max i Force or something like that, picture of the engine. It's a V6. I predict it's going to be the V... Uh, V35A, which is a dynamic force V6, which you will find in the LS500. Most likely, that's the engine of choice. We'll find out if that's confirmed. That is not confirmed. The other thing is, it's a hybrid. I don't know if anybody noticed in that picture. At the very back of the engine cover, there's an orange wire. It's a hybrid. Uh, to me, that is confirmed. It is a hybrid, unless that's the prototype, and they're going to cancel it at some point and decide to go otherwise. But that's what I take from it. It looks great, but really, I am actually intrigued by them as well. I was going to buy a RAV4 Prime, then I went to a 4Runner, then I was like, eh, maybe I'll get an Avalon, and now I'm all over the place. Now I've decided I'm going to wait for the Tundra because we'll see how that looks and how it drives. But uh, yeah, the Tundra is coming. It's probably going to be V6 twin turbo, V35A engine, for, similar to the LS500. Dynamic force engine, which is very similar to the four cylinder, just has two more cylinders and it's a peak. And uh, the other thing is, it's going to be a hybrid. It has rear coil springs. You've seen that leak. Uh, we're hoping it's going to be something that uh, doesn't intrude too much on the ancientness, but kind of improves on it, but not go too far where the thing is just completely different and it's all new tech, new stuff, and we don't know what's what. And all that ancient stuff that sells the current one goes out the window. So Carlos Bayardo, what is the oil for the rear differential in a Lexus 450H? Uh, that's going to be Toyota ATF WS. So that's a hybrid. One thing you need to know is hybrids, for the most part, not 100%, but most of the mainstream hybrids, they're going to take transmission fluid WS in their eCBT transmission and in their rear differential Unlike the non-hybrids where they're going to take gear oil in the back in the, trans in the differential. So keep an eye for that. So Art Vendley says, 2004 GX470 airbag light is lit on the dash. I think it came on after I hit a speed bump. Kind of hard. What should I look for? So the first thing, really, you're going to need to retrieve codes. It's really hard to tell without, um, without reading codes because it's, it's a needle in a haystack. Could be something very simple. Could be something big. We have to find out. 
But here is some, just to give you an, an idea of what could be the issues. Could be as simple as a seat calibration if this has occupant detection. Could be something as simple as that. She needs a little calibration. It actually set a code, uh, calibration needed after impact. Sometimes that happens, it just moves, shakes the seat too much where it goes out of calibration. We've seen that before. Another thing is the connectors underneath the seats. They always get a lot of kind of, they get beat up from stuff underneath the seat, moving the seat and all that. They get beat up and they, they kind of start having bad contact. That's very common. Sienna's one that actually had a campaign on it. But if that gets moved from that jar of the, of the bump that you went into, it could be why you're having this issue. Um, I wouldn't try anything with the airbag if you've never worked with the airbag, but kind of disconnect the battery if you want for at least 90 seconds, then move all and get underneath the front seats, especially the passenger seat. For some reason, it always is the passenger seat. Move all the, all the yellow connectors, make sure they're plugged in, make sure everything else is plugged in, nothing is, is otherwise damaged. Um, plug the battery back and it's good. The third, if it, see if, it's, if it goes away or not. The third thing is, it could be a crash sensor that kind of went, didn't like what it saw and now it just threw a code for it. That's why you need to start with the code and go from there. So AB, th you're welcome, man. I'm glad I could help. Let's see. So Maverick CR watched a lot of your videos. Thank you. You said the later, the late 2015-16 are the most reliable models. What exactly is considered late? So that's a very good question. If you buy a 2015 model year that is made in 14 or late 14, that is a, an early an early built. You're still in the previous model year. Usually between June and August is when the new year model will come out. So you still have a few months before you're actually in that year, production-wise at least. So if you buy a late 15, you're buying a 15 made in 15, made from January all the way potentially to August. Because once you pass August, now you're into the 16 model year made in 15. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. That's kind of weird. I don't understand why. Why can't we just get the... Uh, 2015 in January 1st. I don't know why they can't do that, but that's the way the cookie crumbled. I actually have a friend that recently, not recently, actually April, that's not recently, time flies for me, but a Acura MDX something. It's a 2022 and it was built in April. I'm sorry, but that's, that's very far away. We're eight months out. And I even like doubted him. I'm like, wait a minute. What do you mean it's, it's 2022? I opened the door. The build date is April 21. And it's a 2022 model. Oh, well, I guess it's a 2022 model. So there you go. So sometimes it's all over the place. I don't know if Toyota does that, but that was Honda for you. So Anthony W. Have a 2014 Camry four-cylinder. I changed the trans fluid at 80,000 miles by dropping pan, cleaning the magnets. When and what service is next? So you're at 80,000 miles. If you haven't changed the coolant already, you're already at time, that would need to be replaced. Another thing is the spark plugs are going to be due at 120 or 10 years, whichever comes first. Honestly, after that, you're good. After 60,000 miles for six years, do the same thing with the transmission or just the drain and fill, whatever you prefer. And you're really on track with the maintenance. It keeps up with the oil changes. I highly recommend it 5,000 on that engine. It's your W20 synthetic and life is good. So Brent Moeller, do you know who will put a... F Wait a second. Do you know who will put a 4.6 V8 out of the GX460 in my 2020 Tacoma? That is not exactly a uh, straightforward swap because, uh, and honestly, I don't know if you even think if it's a worthy one because here is the Tacoma is a very nice car and actually holds their value. You put that V8 in there, it just completely loses its value. So just letting you know that that's a monumental task. I don't really know if anybody's done it. I don't really do that kind of work, but that's... Uh, so Maverick CR, should I go with the 2008 Japan Highlander Sport or 1516? Personally, 1516, engine-wise, transmission-wise, and most mechanical-wise, they're similar. But I'll go 1516. It's a much nicer car. The 
the 2008 to 2013, good car, too plasticky on the inside. I don't really like the interiors. I think the, 15, the 14 and up really made a huge difference, even in the way the thing drives, how quiet it is, and everything inside. Just It feels like a nicer car overall. And now that they're close in price, I think it's worth it. The 15, 16, I mean. So, Sam, how to reset a 13 Camry radio? There's, these radios don't have a code or reset or anything. The only hard reset you could do is unplug the battery for, say, five, 10 minutes and replug it. If it's the kind of radio that can take a reset or reset at that point, but otherwise, that's the only thing you can do about it. So, is it safe to do an ATF change on 120,000 mile? 120,000 mile used Yaris. I have no idea if it has been changed before. Honestly, it depends the year. If you're 07, 08, eh, that's kind of too much. I would be wary a little bit. Check the transmission fluid condition. If it's too dark, kind of has a burnt smell to it, I'll leave it alone. If it's clean, then yes, change it. If it's slightly dark, but it's not burned, and you, if you shine a light at it, you still see red, not brown. Go ahead and change it. You should be okay. But just drain and fill. Don't don't do flush at this at this point. So Jorge Lopez, are you planning another meetup in the Chicago area anytime soon, like the previous one with the Toyota Forerunner? That was actually one of the things I wanted to talk about, and I was actually going to make a poll later. Uh, but since uh, Jorge brought it up, let's do this. I want to make a meet where we all meet. Look, guys, some people think that. I am, I consider myself this YouTube influencer and all this. Folks, I am just a average guy. I have a family. I run. I work very hard. I am not better than anyone, and I'm probably worse than a lot of people. I'm just an average guy. I would love to meet you all, talk, check out the cars, you know, just car guys talking car stuff. I know most car guys will prefer to do Lamborghinis and whatever. I'm just a normal guy. I, you know, I would love to meet you all. I'm not, I'm not against meeting and everything. And now with the COVID kind of improving, if you would, we, especially here in Illinois, things are getting slightly better. We're still in caution, but better. I would love to make, do a meet. If you guys are interested, um, comment in the comments because sometimes some of the chat disappears. I don't know why I can't go back and read it later, but let me know. We can set up a meet and I'll still put a poll to see, how much of the viewer percentages in Chicago's, if they're interested in making a meet, um, we'll get the guys. I know two clubs, at least that are, that I've talked to briefly and they are interested, the same forerunner group. And there's actually a Supra group. I don't know if you all want a bunch of uh, BMWs disguised as uh, Toyotas in the, in the meet, but Hey, we'll mix it up. We got a, it's still a Toyota and they're more than welcome. But uh, yes, I am very interested. We'd love to do it again and would love to meet more guys. I, I, it was a pleasure to meet some of the viewers and some new people that I didn't know. It was awesome to meet that. And it was very fun to look at the awesome forerunners that were there. There were some really nice forerunners there. Um, <clears throat> Boiled Nuts, thank you so much. By the way, um, I forgot to say that. Happy Father's Day to everybody who is a father and to your parents. And I wish you all enjoy the day off. I will uh, be serving at church, so that'll be uh, a full day of serving, but I do that with pleasure. So I hope you all enjoy your Father's Day. And let's see. So Kalunat says, what is the best product to clean Toyota leather seats? Thanks. Is it a leather seat is the first question you want to ask yourself. Because most Toyota leather, leather seats are not actually leather seats. And if that's the case, you really don't need to do much. You could just use interior cleaner and life is good. But if you have actual leather seats, I use products from, honestly, every time I use a different product, I have a car with leather seats and Mother's works good. And I'm not recommending a specific product. Buy a, usually, you don't have to go crazy with Toyota leather seats. They usually hold pretty well. You just want to condition them and clean them frequently enough so, to keep them um, fresh and clean. But as far as product recommendations, I am not into detailing a lot, so I don't want to give you a recommendation, but I use products from Mothers, and that seemed to work good for me. 
Rick Troutner, sorry if I misread your name. I am replacing the water bypass hose which bursts on a 1999 ES300. Should I replace the fuel injector seats and seals? What about the knock sensors? So, yes. If at the bare minimum, replace the harness for the knock sensor. They're notorious to get brittle and hard. And as soon as you move them, they break. And now you're back to square one. If you want to replace the knock sensors, do me a favor. And more importantly, do yourself a favor. Change them with original. Make sure you torque them to spec. If they are the screw type, torque them to spec and you're good. If they are the plastic type where they turn, make sure you take a picture before you take them off and install them exactly in the same position. We have been through this where people install them and we have problems. So make sure of that. And the other thing is absolutely replace the injector seals and seats. Yes, you're going to remove the intake manifold as a whole. You're not even going to take the rail out. But at this age, I would definitely consider... Sorry, phone call. Not now. Uh, I would definitely consider replacing the injector seals at this age. Wouldn't hurt. And while you're there, I would put a uh, valve cover gaskets. If you haven't done them soon, you might as well. Might, we're going to have to pull them out. And, and, oh, my God, what would I want to say? I want to tell you one more thing. Thermostat. Don't know if I mentioned that or not. I'm losing my mind here a little bit. <laughs> um, thermostat, valve cover gaskets, PCB valve spark plugs. The things that you would need to do when you pull the plenum. If they're all good and have been done recently, call it the day and that's it. But definitely do at least the wire for the knock sensor. So, Lion Runner. My Forerunner has stock 26570 R17 nitros with 41 pounds, changing it to 275. Low at Falcon is eight, at 58 pounds, or load EKO2 at 56 pound bad. So the more it's very simple. Phone runs don't really get great gas mileage to begin with. Um, the downside of adding a heavier tire. Uh, I'm trying to read your your question here. Make sure I understand. Okay, so the Log Falcon is heavier than the KO2. So the more weight you add, of course, the gas mileage goes out of the window. But I guess at this point, this shouldn't be a priority. But the one thing that it will do, having heavier tires, that most people might overlook is wheel bearing and ball joints. You're going to want to keep an eye on those. On the Forerunners, not as common anymore. They seem to improve a little bit, but wheel bearing, especially in the front, notorious to go bad. And watch out for them. Make sure every other oil change, you lift the tire, unload the ball joints, and check them. Wouldn't hurt. I'm not expecting them to fail very early. They're very stout, very strong, but just don't expect to have 150,000 miles and think it's 10 years old. And, uh, oh, yeah, we'll just keep going with these big, heavy tires. You might get the ball joints or the um, wheel bearings to their end sooner than if you would have stayed with just the, the stock tires, even non, non-mud non or, um, you know, all-terrain tires. But that's the only thing I would watch for. Otherwise, you know, the gas mileage thing, yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be affected, but I guess even with the nitros, it's going to happen. Full runners don't really get the best gas mileage to begin with. So, let's see. Alan Sunshine, how do you get the stuck and hard spark plug gasket off the valve cover? That's what I'm trying to... 2006 RAV4 V6, 210,000 miles. I chip it to pieces with a flathead screwdriver and a hammer. Honestly, that's the only way you're going to get it out. Eventually, some some of them get so stubborn, especially the original ones, you just have to beat them out. There's no other way to it. But be careful. Don't damage the valve cover. That's the one thing I'll tell you. You're going to have to sometimes, and this is extreme, and you've got to be very careful to do this, you're going to have to go in with a Dremel tool. The seal is around. It has a metal actually inside, and that's what gets seized. With a Dremel tool, kind of chip at it slowly until you break the ring and then they come out. That's the only thing I can think of. But one thing I will tell you, and this is, I see this all the time. Some people will, will not like what they're about to hear, especially DIY mechanics. Why are you replacing the seals? Do you have oil in the spark plug tube? Well, that's not going to fix that. You need to pull the tube out. 
which is pressed in, unfortunately, and uh, reseal it. Just thought I'd let you know that. Unfortunately, uh, that's that's the reality of things. Joseph Pickle, when would you know if the 2017 Lexus NX200T 2.0 Turbo is a good engine, or are they known issue carbon buildup, oil dilution? So they haven't been out for a very long time, and Lexus typically, Toyota's been experimenting with Lexus lately, which you would think it would be the opposite, but they, they really do all their experimentation in Lexus. Then once it passes their experimentation, they're going to introduce it in Toyota side. So this is one of them. Turbo engines, eventually, I own turbo a turbo car. Eventually, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when things go south of the turbo. Some of them will last a lot longer than others, but it's inevitable. Unfortunately, that's how the cookie crumples with turbo engines. So far, though, there hasn't been a lot of issues. When they first came out, there was like one or two isolated issues with turbos on the NX200, but they were not common. They were not mainstream. They were more production stuff. But other than that, I haven't really seen or heard any issues with them. And I actually, I am looking into it from time to time because we don't, I work at a Toyota dealership. We don't get them as much as let's say some of the older models, they start trickling into Toyota dealership more, but the NX is relatively new. We don't see them as much, but I have a lot of contacts at Lexus and I'm always trying to get updated because this engine eventually is going to make its way to Toyota. Maybe you know, now with the A25, that might not be the case anymore, but they've been good. There's no carbon issue. There's no dilution issues. So far, so good. Don't know what's going to happen in the future, but turbos eventually when the thing is 15 years old is going to go out and you're going to have to replace it. But so far, they've been doing really good. Other manufacturers and models that had turbos, usually by the five-year mark, they have some kind of issues. So I'll let you know that, but that's how uh, it is. So Nate Kerb says, 06 Tacoma V6. I got a PO171 two-lean bank code. I changed the mass airflow, but check engine light comes on and goes with two sensor or what? This is going to need diagnosis. The first thing is, do you have bad gas? Do you have air leaks? That's another thing that most people just go not think about or just skip over. Check for or air leaks. Check little vacuum leaks. There's a lot of that areas where in the intake after the mass airflow that you could have a leak. Make sure you check, cover your bases before you jump into the big stuff. Um, you're going to need some diagnosis because I don't want you just to throw air fuel ratio sensors at this thing and then find out it was something else. There's actually a way in the scan tool to test that. And, and I highly encourage you to do that. You just active test it and you'll see if the air fuel ratio sensors are going all over the place or they're good. That's how you diagnose this properly. But one thing I will also tell you, do you have exhaust leaks? Because we have seen a few Tacomans that do this. The, make sure you don't have any exhaust leaks between the O2 sensors. If you do, believe it or not, it's, it's, for some reason, they'll pull air and they'll dilute the first O2 sensor, the AF sensor, and it'll cause all kinds of weird um, lean codes. So look into that. Lean codes are, can be difficult to diagnose. When you put that mass airflow, was it original? Did it change the mass airflow reading? You're going to have to look at the scan tool data before you start throwing parts because it could get very expensive and you're going nowhere. So that's one thing I will tell you about that. So, Giorgio F78, is that an F? Yes, it is. <laughs> I have a 2018 Toyota 4Run TRDF Road, and my only issue is the new car smell is gone. Yeah, that, that is a problem. That does happen, unfortunately. You know, they, but the good thing with the 4Runners, when, when the new car smell goes, it still behaves like a new car. It just, the smell is gone, and that's okay. Usually... Uh, Forerunner's new car smell get replaced with uh, 25 year old car smell that runs like a new car. The Forerunners are awesome, folks. If they change it and they mess this up, I'm going to be upset with Toyota for real. So, Anthony, sorry, we already answered this one. Real world garage, folks. Not a fan of pressure washing modern engines. You know what? If you do it right, I, I, I'm 100% with you, brother. You're a mechanic, I and mean, we both know what, how modern engines versus old engines are. 
if you are careful with modern engines and kind of try to avoid the electrical connectors, they should be okay. But here's an advice for most that actually, if you keep up with your engine cleaning with a spray bottle, just a little spray bottle, and you clean it often, not just let it be every year, you're actually not gonna need to pressure wash it and go all out. If that makes you feel more comfortable, I mean, I personally don't really pressure wash my engine at all. Just every oil change, I clean everything by hand with a with a rag, and it just stays clean, and that's that's that. But yeah, some of them, I I understand, I hear you. So Andrew Solomon, good night, sir. Have a Toyota Fielder Hybrid 2016. How do I get the Japanese dance change to English? So I don't even know what a Fielder Hybrid is. I have to Google it because we don't have that model in the U.S. And as far as changing the dance to English, there's not really a simple way through the Toyota land, but I don't know, do they sell that model somewhere else where there's English? That's the only way, maybe swap components, but I really don't have an answer for you there because that's outside of my neighborhood of knowledge because uh, we don't have that model. So Alejandro Marino, thoughts on installing an oil catch cam for 15 Prius 2 that I am planning to keep it for a long time. Currently at 60,000 miles. So it should have a catch cam built in. It has an oil separator. It's not a very sophisticated one. Look, install the catch cam. It will, it will not cause more harm. It could cause good, but technically it shouldn't cause any good because it already has the same thing built into it. But unfortunately, with the, with the these, these generation Prius, although yours is excluded from that, they do have the tendency to build a lot of carbon and clogs the EGR and then makes its way in the intake. And now we have a lot, all these issues. But yours is the good one that doesn't burn oil because usually you have the carbon buildup on the EGR on top of oil burning, and now you have all this mess. Do one thing on the on the on your Prius. Consider changing that um, PCV valve. I've seen. I'm starting to see a few that are actually bad flat out they're just clogged up with especially the ones that burn oil yours should not be one of them because the 15 was actually updated the engine was updated but do change that pcb valve especially when you when you get around spark plugs you're a little far from that four years from that and about 40 uh, 40 60 000 miles away from that but wouldn't hurt to change it because i'm starting to see a few that, that actually go bad bad where they're stuck or uh, stuck closed or even stuck open. I've seen a few. That's uh, interesting. So Alejandro Marino says, I used to do 10,000 mile one year oil changes per the factory service guide, but thinking of switching to five, six months after watching your videos. Look, it's, it's, you're going to do yourself a huge favor by doing that. And some people argue with that, but oil is cheap. It, you will cannot there's nobody that will come and tell you you will cause harm by changing it early but i i will tell you from experience you will do good if you're keeping this car long take care of it five thousand miles six six month oil changes trust me you're not going to regret it i gain nothing from telling you this i just gain you taking care of your car and it lasting you a long time and you have no issues like oil burning and all the disasters that come afterwards. So, so Billy Albers, please answer my previous question. I did not see your question, Billy. I will scroll through and try to find it, but if I did not find it and I didn't, and we reached the end because we we're getting close to the end of the live stream, please leave a comment on the video. And that's just not to Billy, to everybody. If I don't get to your question, um, sorry, but I only allow it. I have to spend time with my family and do everything else. If I do not get to your question, you're welcome to leave a comment on this video and any of the videos once the live stream is over and I'll get back to you. That's the best way of getting in contact. So Lexus man, thoughts on your favorite engine, the 2ZR FXE. So I like it. The FXE is the hybrid variant of that. They do tend to burn oil especially the 2010 and to 2014. They burn a lot of oil. We've had some issues with that, head gaskets, few issues with that. But the later version, let's say 15 or even better, 16 and up that came in the Prius, they're really good so far. And we've seen some crazy miles on the on the taxis. 
and life is good. They're holding up really well. They're not burning oil. They don't have issues. I think I've seen one the other day with 250,000 miles, 16, 17 Prius. Uh, we've seen a Prius Prime with almost 200,000 miles. That was actually a viewer. They're holding up well. They've, the updates they did to them, they seem to be much better. So... So Doko BG1, when do you re do you replace 2018-2020 Camry 2.5 engine air filter as needed? Every oil change, pull the air filter out, takes two seconds. I encourage you to do it yourself. Look at the filter. Is it dirty? Replace it. It's not. Vacuum underneath it so all that dirt wouldn't get picked up into the filter and call it a day. So in focus photography, did Toyota update the needle bearing on the Tacoma? I have a 21 Sport and I know previous year had issues with small lifts. So the thing is the needle bearing. The needle bearing was an actual issue on the Forerunner, not because of the lift, but that was their uh, that was their their an actual issue production. When you lift these trucks, you're always going to load the needle bearing. Now, I have seen a lot of recent Tacomas that are lifted. They don't seem to have an issue. However, I don't know if they don't have an issue or people are not reporting it because they know of, of the modifications. They're not going to bring it to a dealership. I couldn't really tell you an answer about that. But every time you lift a truck, you got to watch your axle angles. I've had a forerunner recently that had multiple axle boot ripoff because it was lifted and the diff was not dropped. It's just simple physics. You put the car up, you put, sorry, you put the car on the floor and you look in the front axle, especially the front, because they have, they don't have a solid axle. They have CV axle. So you look at the axle, you want it to be almost flat when the car is sitting straight. I had a forerunner the other day that the axles were like this. They're just hanging down. This is where it goes into the differential and my arms are the axle hanging down. That's going to chew up your axle, and worse than the axle. The axle boot you can replace, not a big deal. But the needle bearing, you're chewing at that. You're loading that bearing on one side. You're kind of hanging from it. That's not good. So doing a lift, you have to watch your final axle um, angles. Do you want them to be? I mean, if you look at the stock one, before you do the lift, take a picture of the stock one. That's what you want to accomplish in the end almost flat i mean some of them even the axle will be pushed up a little bit that's what you want to achieve because if you lift it and that's not your angle you need to drop the diff you need to do something to make it straight otherwise a needle bearing problem is eminent at this point but before that the axles will start tearing up ripping up before you even get to the needle bearing so billy albers here's your question what's your thought on a 2017 toyota rav4 limited I got one with only 47,000 miles a couple of months ago. So I think the 2017 RAV4 is a great car. It's, it's, most people will ask me, do, should I buy like a 16 to 18? I always recommend this is actually a very good RAV4 to buy. Should you buy like a 16 to 18 RAV4 or should we buy 19 and up? I, this is my typical answer. The 16 to 18, which yours is a 17 right in the middle of that, this is the last RAV4 that is very basic, basic construction, basic everything, not really crazy on technology. It has good technology where it makes it appealing, has some creature comforts, but it's not all out. You go to the 19 and you notice even the price difference is, is it's a big jump, even though I understand it's a new model, but comparing 18 MSRP to 19 MSRP, there was a slight jump. It's because the 19 is spaceship level. Doesn't mean it's bad. It's actually a very nice, nice uh, SUV, but there was a lot of change. The chassis is different. The engine, the transmission, everything was completely different. And let's say the 18 RAV4 was more of an old school design. I mean, that design goes all the way to 2009. So if you want simplicity, if you want just honest to God reliability, not crazy impressive features, but enough comfort features where it's good for most, that's a very good car. And at the prices, you notice their prices dropped a little bit, but now they're going back up because they are very reliable if you take care of them, seriously. And especially the 16 to um, 18, they had 
the best reliability because some of the early ones they had a few isolated issues here and there but the later ones were much better and the limited has all the bells and whistles not everything like a base model 19 but enough bells and whistles to make it interesting so so folks we're, we're reaching the end of the live stream I, I told you i had to spend time with my family and accommodate everybody so we're going to take three last questions i'm going to go random on this one so we get some of the other the end of the questions if you got like i told you if i didn't answer your question and you really need an answer please leave a comment any of my videos doesn't matter i'll get back to you another thing is if you're liking this live stream make sure you give it a thumbs up if you don't give it a thumbs down i guess and uh, let's do the last three questions. Now I'll give you some updates on the up, some upcoming videos and some general stuff on the channel. Okay. Ah, I see Andrew is here. Guys, Andrew is, a, is an ex-Nissan technician, and now he's a Toyota technician. And I already see him answering stuff and helping out. Huge shout out to you, Andrew. You're a good man and an awesome technician. Thank you so much for joining the live stream, sir. So, let's take this one. David Sherman, 2014 CNX LE, the automatic sliding doors have recently started to not close properly. They get almost closed, then they open, then stop and open back. Yes, this is the rear hinges. But before you go fixing it yourself, call your dealership because Toyota has a program to replace the hinge for free. We like free. Um, call your dealership, inquire about the program, tell them, hey, I think I have bad hinges. Is my car covered for the hinges? They didn't have mileage. They have like a time. I don't really remember. I mean, there's so many of these pro little programs, it's hard to keep up with them. But they will punch in your VIN number. They'll tell you, is it expired? Is it good? If it's good, Take it in, schedule an appointment. They will look at it and they'll tell you, yep, these hinges, they'll order it. They need to be painted. They replace it. Life's good. Typical on these minivans. That's why Toyota is taking care of owners. That's what Toyota does because it is Toyota. When they hear enough people uh, barking at them for disasters that they cause, like the bad hinge on a 14 Sienna, they will say, okay, well, I guess we'll just fix it for free for a while so people will be happy and keep buying the awesome Sienna otherwise. So do call your dealership because you're gonna get this fixed for free, most likely. So, so the dreamer, let's take this one. My 2009 Camry has a ripped CV boot in less than two years of fix. My mechanic said that normal wear and tear, the warranty only covers internal wear like the bearings. Should, should I have got one from the dealership? Yes, that, that doesn't make sense. Now, the, my question to you is, and I'll give you both scenarios to my answer. Is this an aftermarket axle? Folks, do not put an aftermarket axle in a Toyota. I see this so much. It is, I have to bring it up now. Now you're going to make me have the axle conversation. I want to save this for a video, but let's have it. I'll make it short, I promise. Um, the axles. Toyota axles are like five, six hundred sets. Five to six hundred dollars on average. That's ridiculous for an axle when you can go to AutoZone down the street and buy one for a hundred bucks. Buck and a quarter sometimes. People are like, was Toyota robbing us? No, actually it's AutoZone that is not AutoZone, but the cheapo axle you're buying aftermarket. They're very common that I get an axle. This is for a Sienna. Okay. Go, it doesn't fit. It's not the right size. It's not even from a Sienna. Okay, get another one. It fits. They have the same part number. I'm like, okay, that doesn't look good. Second thing is they're not balanced. I've had a customer the other day. Sienna, there was, I think it was an 06 Sienna. Bad axle. I told him about the CV. It was one of those where, okay, sir, you need a CV boot. Nope. Need a CV boot. Nope. Ran drive. Broke the axle. Okay, now you need an axle. That's 600 bucks. CV boot was not 600 bucks. We put an axle and the thing starts shaking. We put another axle, didn't fit because it was the wrong one. Put another axle, it still shook. Okay, well the guy got upset and he ended up buying the original axle, perfect. Don't buy aftermarket axles. If you have a leaking boot, fix the boot. End of the story. 
Ax Toyota axles are really good. And if this is an aftermarket one, invest in an original axle and you'll never have a problem. If this is not an aftermarket one and this was, and your mechanic just replaced the CV boots, he did something wrong because either didn't use the right tool to tighten the clamps, that's a very big one, and or he damaged one of the clamps and installed a generic clamp. That's that's really the only reason they will leak. Or you have something bent. The bracket, especially if this is, you do not specify if it's passenger or or driver, but on the on the Camry, the pa the passenger side has that little bracket with the bearing. That bracket is notorious to seize, and some people, some mechanics will beat it up and bend it. Now you have a problem. You're kind of not lining up that axle right, and you're going to have problems. So that's another thing. Don't go aftermarket with axles, please. I see people doing this. They have a little leak on the axle, and, and some aftermarket mechanic that. The, that doesn't know any better. Oh, let's just change the axles cheaper than uh, putting uh, CV boots on it. But you know what? Yeah, the labor might be more, but the axle is not better because you're taking your original perfectly fine axle, just has a little leak, and putting this junk axle that is aftermarket. Just fix the boot and call it a day, and life is good. All right, folks. So let's take the last question here. And before, because the... Last is always first. Let's take the last question. Here we go. Sonny Sen says, Hi, looking to buy a 2006 Scion XA with 68,000 miles from a private seller. What are the main things I should look for? These are really, really good cars if they are not from the rust belt. That is the one thing that really gets, chews them up is the rust. If they don't have rust, one thing I would check is um, these had a, I'm trying to remember here, it's been a while. They had kind of a hard drive belt to do. There's two drive belts. That's just how, how they, uh, they they are designed. Check the drive belts. They're notorious to make noise when you first started. They're uh, a little bit of a pain to replace, DIY especially. But you're going to go through drive belts on this thing. That's just how they are. It has a manu manual tensioner that doesn't really work very well. And otherwise, they're really good cars. Make sure you buy one that's taken care of, or this one, though, is the one you're looking at, 68,000 miles. It's very promising. Just make sure it's not a rusty bucket because there's a lot of those and less of the nice ones. So I thought uh, I'd let you know that. But this is a good car. Go for it. Make sure maintenance is good. No rust. Check for oil leaks. They tend to, kind of like they are, as we talked about a little bit earlier, they tend to leak oil from the front cover and the head gasket oil externally. If you see a lot of oil, maybe negotiate the price and consider fixing. That's not the end of the world to fix it, but, you know, consider it in the price if you would. All right, everybody. Before we wrap up the live stream, I'll just give you a sneak peek. I hope you all are enjoying the current series on um, how Toyota plug-in hybrids work. One thing I will mention that somebody had mentioned, and it kind of caught my attention. This is a Toyota and Lexus and Scion channel. This is not a Toyota hybrid only channel. However, y'all have requested this series a lot, and that's why I made it. And it's actually been a long time, and I've held off until I found the perfect situation where I can film this series. So that is one thing. And the other thing is we're going to continue the series, and next you're going to see the RAV4 Prime. You're not going to see an actual RAV4 Prime because, unfortunately, I couldn't get one from Toyota because uh, there's apparently only three in Chicago currently rolling around. But I did give you all, I'm going to give you all the technical details. And we're going to talk about the world's most complicated uh, HVAC system, which is really the world's most complicated. It's just, if you think the, the Prius Prime was bad, you wait till the RAV4 Prime. You're gonna, you guys are going to like this one. After that, we're going to go out of that series. We have a few DIY videos, actually a new segment on DIY videos. I'll, I'll uh, keep you wondering about that. And then we have a engine teardown. That picture format, but it's still nonetheless a 2G RFE. You guys gave me the thumbs up for that, so we're going to go ahead and do that. And after that, you're going to see some Highlander content that a lot of people have requested, and I've put you off long enough. If you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up, guys. Thank you so much. And before I wrap up, for all the fathers out there, happy Father's Day. I wish you all the best. Enjoy your Sunday. Be safe out there. And until the next live stream and the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you guys have a wonderful day.